This week, we explore what the New Age magazine once thought about Martian life and how to communicate with Mars. A Masonic magazine talking about communications with Mars? That's right. We'll be shooting for the stars as we check out this awesome article from Dr. John Bozeman. Then, we'll hear from illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison as he gives us the perfect recipe to putting on a Masonic event. We'll wrap it up with a discussion on fear and how Freemasonry can help us overcome our base fears, our irrational fears, what Sigmund Freud coined neurotic fear. All this and more coming right up. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. This is episode number 512. Welcome back to the show. First up, want to go ahead and thank all of our contributors, our fellows, and our producers, and especially our legacy partners. Without you, we cannot do this show, and I just want to thank all of those people who help bring this program to everyone week after week, month after month, year after year. We've been doing this show 10 years now, and it's been an incredible ride, which is literally unable to be completed without the help of these individuals. Whether you've contributed in the past for a short while or given a one-time donation, all those things really help. And so I want to thank you really from the bottom of my heart to be able to bring Masonic education to the masses the world over. If you're curious about how you can help this program spread Masonic light and tenets of Masonic virtues and all of these things to the world, head on over to WCYpodcast.com, click on support the show and see how you can help. Now, in the news... Yep, I got to mention this whole Knight Templar thing is crazy. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, I'm not going to get into it because there are two wonderful podcasts out there that really go into depth on this whole issue, and that's going to be the Rocky Mountain Mason podcast. Now, I've had Brother Ben on this program before. Ben's a really good friend of mine, and I know he's a friend of yours. Great guy. I would just say check out the Rocky Mountain Mason podcast and consider becoming a patron of his. And here's why because he has patron only episodes where he gets even more into detail with some of the things that uh, he is an expert on. And in particular, this whole Knight Templar fiasco that's going on right now, which is literally incredible. So if you're living under a rock, check this out. It is definitely some wild Masonic drama that is playing out. I hope cooler heads prevail. As always, we are Masons first and foremost, and we should act as such. With that in mind, check out what's going on there. I'll have a link back to the Rocky Mountain Mason podcast in our show notes. Now, it is Sunday night, the 12th of September, if you're listening to this on the release night. This week, I will be making a trip to uh, the D.C. area to do a talk with my brother John Ruark, the co-author of the Master's Word Annotated Edition. He and I put in a lot of hours to put together this book. The Master's Word by George Plumer was really a, a fantastic book that did so much to bridge the ideas of science and philosophy and New Ageism into a concise, understandable format. But even as understandable as it was, it is not completely understandable to the modern reader. So John and I annotated the entire book, added some uh, great new content in the form of prologues and epilogues, and uh, it got great reviews. It's gotten rave reviews really everywhere and people who have uh, checked out the book. And so if you're interested in that, you know, you can of course get it on amazon.com. It's available in hardcover and in paperback. Both editions are really great. Uh, if you'd like an autographed copy, you can head on over to wcypodcast.com, click on the shop, and you can get that from me. I'll autograph it and send it back. But I'll be doing a talk with John about that book at a lodge out there in the D.C. area. Shortly after that, the following week, I'm going to be in Arizona doing a really cool festive board. I've got a brand new talk that I'm putting together for them. It'll be a premiere talk. I've never done it before. And I'm excited about that, to share some time with brothers in Arizona for a festive board experience. And I'll be out there for a couple days looking forward to decompressing a little bit and spending some quality fellowship with brothers. And then what's after that? 
Well, gee whiz, it's going to be Grand Lodge Sessions for Illinois. And I do understand a lot of other Masonic organizations out there are also having their sessions right around this time, October, November, kind of year-end. And um, I think we all have to be careful with with COVID and, and do our part there, regardless of whatever you're comfortable with. But I think we can all agree that we need to do our best to mitigate risk. So, um, you know, just do your part and uh, whatever that it means to you. The Grand Lodge sessions this year is in person. I'm hoping that uh, COVID doesn't get in the way, get any worse, that is. So with that, that will be exciting. I've got a little bit of news for you, more about the uh, Grand Lodge sessions, Illinois, as uh, we move through the episode. I do want to welcome back Brother Darren Lanners. He hit the road this last uh, couple weeks with his lady and his youngest son, and he had some real adventures. I would recommend checking out the latest article on the Midnight Freemasons blog when you get a chance. I'll go ahead and link that in there too. You guys can check it out. It's uh, it's a fun piece and he did a great job on it. Now some big, big news. Perhaps the biggest news so far. For immediate release, the Scottish Rite Valley of Washington, D.C., a unique Masonic education night with Academy Award winning brother Richard Dreyfus, 32nd degree. Yeah, that's right. So the actor, Richard Dreyfus, Jaws, and Mr. Holland's Opus, that Richard Dreyfus. It was announced on September 3rd, 2021. Washington, D.C., the Scottish Rite, Valley of Washington, D.C., proudly presents a unique Masonic Education Night with Academy Award winning actor, Brother Richard Dreyfus, 32nd degree, which will be happening on September 17th, 2021, at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. So that's 4 p.m. Pacific and it will be 6 p.m. Central Time. This will be a webinar event open to Masons only. In 2026, the United States will celebrate its 250th anniversary. Are we ready for that? What is the common ground on which we can engage one another constructively as citizens in today's polarized America? And what about Freemasonry and the role of Freemasons? Imagine what would happen to Freemasonry if, due to the absence of Masonic education, its members were to become ignorant of its tenets, cardinal virtues, and core mission. A Freemason would lose the knowledge of the tools, implements, and skills needed to better himself as a free builder. Likewise, imagine what would happen to America if, due to the absence of civics education, its citizens were to become ignorant of the core principles of freedom and democratic republican self-governance. Americans would lose the knowledge of the tools, mechanisms, and skills needed to engage one another constructively for the purpose of advancing their human condition. Tune in to a most interesting conversation with Academy Award winner and brother Richard Dreyfus, 32nd degree, who will enlighten us with his perspective as a Freemason on civics and civic engagement. This event is going to take place in the form again of a webinar on Friday, September 17th, which is Constitution Day, again 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern, open to Masons only. You can RSVP for the free event. It's totally for you guys. Go to tinyurl.com backslash AASR as in Ancient Accepted Scottish Rite, Dreyfus, D-R-E-Y-F-U-S-S, two S's, A-A-S-R-D-R-E-Y-F-U-S-S. I'll have a link back in the show notes to that as well. It's going to be an awesome presentation. I'm really excited to be involved in it, and we're going to have some awesome questions for Brother Richard Dreyfus. Now, let's go ahead and get into this week's first piece I recently opened up the journal, the magazine of the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction. This one I really enjoyed on a personal level because it had a really cool article on science in it. So after reading it, I had to get in touch with the journal. So I wrote the journal and I said, hey, guys, is there any way you can put me in contact with the author and get me permission to read this article on the podcast? Well, not 24 hours later, I received an email back from the Scottish Rite, and they were excited to the idea. And the author, who, by the way, is not a brother, also was excited to allow the piece to be read in its entirety 
this week. So I'm really excited to bring this particular article to your attention, and it's by Dr. John M. Bozeman, PhD. Again, not a brother, but some background. Dr. John M. Bozeman holds two master's degrees in religion, a master's in environmental engineering science, and a PhD in science and technology studies. His research interests are religious history and the interplay between science, religion, and technology. Yeah, totally sounds like something right up our alley here at the Whence Came You podcast. So let's check out this article. I think you guys are really going to dig it. A New Age for Science. The Search for Intelligent Life on Mars in 1912. By John M. Bozeman, Ph.D. The New Age magazine, as the Scottish Rite Journal was known for much of its history, carried articles on science in its early years. In March 1912, readers of the New Age magazine were treated to a sumptuous 10-page article on astronomical research entitled The Great Eyes of Science. Containing multiple large illustrations, half of the article was an enthusiastic discussion of large telescopes. Most impressive was the under-construction Mount Wilson Telescope, an instrument with a mirror some 100 inches across, with an expected weight of 5,000 pounds and a cost of $50,000, an enormous sum at that time. Much of the cost was borne by Magnet brother Andrew Carnegie, Freemason of Allegheny Lodge, number 223 F&AM, who called it, quote-unquote, the oracle on the mountaintop to which all the world will listen. While the article speaks of the immense scientific value of this and similar instruments, another motivation is given as well, the quest to see Martians and their works. Indeed, the Mount Wilson Telescope will magnify the canals of Mars 100 million times. If ships are sailing the Martian seas, we shall see the ships in all of their weird novelty. If cities are dotting the Martian plains, we shall see the cities. And if airships are navigating the Martian skies, we shall know it. It is easy enough to suppose that Mars inhabitants may wish to communicate with other planets, just as we should dearly like to communicate with them. The article then discusses the ways that humans might someday communicate with beings who could live on Mars, even including a picture of how the wondrous Martians might appear. In this article, we shall see why the New Age magazine, which then bore the inscription at the top of each issue cover, Literature, Science, Freemasonry, would devote so many pages to this topic as well as examine how this interest in Mars and Martians influenced the broader American culture both then and now. One reason for the interest in Mars was technological. For centuries, humans wondered whether or not intelligent life might exist on other worlds with arguments based in philosophy and theology. By the 1800s, however, it appeared the question might be answered more directly through the use of large telescopes. Then. In 1877, the respected Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli reported seeing canali on the surface of Mars. These features could be interpreted as being either naturally occurring sea channels or as artificial canals. However, these lines sometimes seemed to double, with two lines appearing where before there had been only one. This suggested that people on Mars might be opening or closing canal locks, as happened on Earth. In France, celebrity astronomer Camille Flammarion wrote about Schiaparelli's discovery and added his own observations in an 1892 bestseller, Planet Mars and Its Habitable Conditions. Flammarion noted that the apparent geometric precision of the Martian canals made them likely artificial. Further, he noted that Mars being farther from the Sun cooled first, so any civilization existing there would likely be older than those of the Earth leading him to suggest toward the end of his book, Mars's humanity, whatever it is, must be more advanced than ours. Think of the progress made in our own 19th century. Railways, telegraphic communications, applications of electricity, photography, telescopes, telephone, etc. How might we be dazzled if we could see the material and social progress that the 20th and 21st centuries and beyond have in store for humanity's future? 
the least optimistic spirit holds that aviation will be the ordinary mode of movement. Borders of nations will be erased forever. The hydra of war and unspeakable folly of standing armies, the ruin and stigma of ignorance will be annihilated before the glorious rise of enlightenment and freedom. Is it not logical to assume that those even older than us, the people of Mars are also more sophisticated and with the productive unity of its people, the work of peace has brought about great achievements. Flammarion's views spread to America through the efforts of Percival Lowell, a wealthy businessman and avid amateur astronomer. Lowell read of the European astronomers and in 1894 he borrowed a telescope from Harvard and traveled to Flagstaff, Arizona to view the Earth-Mars conjunction, a time when the two planets were especially close together in their orbits. The following year Lowell built a permanent observatory hiring Harvard's Mars expert William Pickering to manage it and conduct research. Lowell himself was soon traveling and lecturing about Mars and its canals. These canals, he said, appeared to run in perfect, straight geometric lines, indicating likely artificial construction. Lowell suggested that vegetation bordered the canal banks, which were the lines being seen by Earth-based astronomers. Lowell promoted these views in three best-selling books, Mars, 1895, Mars as the Abode of Life, 1908, and Mars and its Canals, 1911. Interest in Mars and communication with its inhabitants blossomed. We know, for example, that a musical score was composed, quote-unquote, a signal from Mars, which went through some eight editions between 1901 and 1916. The piece was used to accompany silent films of the era and a wax cylinder gramophone recording released in 1910. Similarly, we know that telephone inventor Alexander Graham Bell discussed Lowell's ideas at length in a letter to his wife, Mabel Bell, herself an inventor as well, in 1909. It was only natural that discussion arose about how Earth might communicate with Martians. A few suggestions mentioned in a 1912 New Age article included use of huge flags, dark patterns lined out in light desert regions, gigantic electric lights, perhaps powered by generators, using the full energy output of Niagara Falls, and Professor Pickering suggested use of vast arrays of mirrors to flash signals toward the Red Planet. Similar suggestions abounded in publications of the time, including Scientific American, Popular Science, The New York Times, Collier's Weekly, and Cosmopolitan. Nikola Tesla, the great inventor and electrical engineer, suggested using the new technology of radio as well reporting his detection of mysterious signals possibly coming from Mars. In 1919, the New York Times published several articles about Guglielmo Marconi, another major radio inventor, reporting of his search for Martian radio transmissions as well. For a while, there appeared to be a race between Tesla and Marconi as to who would establish Earth-Mars radio communication first. As time passed, astronomers using their vast telescopes began to suspect that Mars might not be as welcoming to life as once thought. This was confirmed when spacecraft began visiting the planet in 1965. However, the early research of Schiaparelli, Flammarion, Lowell, and others inspired a rich literary legacy which inspired later authors and scientific researchers. One major work was H.G. Wells' masterpiece, The War of the Worlds, 1894 a radio drama version of this story directed by and starring Orson Welles famously produced a minor panic in 1938 when it was broadcast on CBS without adequate notice that the Martian invasion being reported was actually a work of fiction. Other important Mars-themed literary works include Tarzan creator Edgar Rice Burroughs' John Carter of Mars book series, first published in a serialized form in 1912. Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles, 1950, Robert Heinlein's Red Planet, and The Stranger in a Strange Land, 1949 and 1961, respectively. And of special interest for us, District of Columbia Masonic Grandmaster Carl H. Claudy's 1933 young adult book, Mystery Men of Mars. This Mars literature, in turn, inspired later works, including aspects of George Lucas's Star Wars and James Cameron's Avatar. The stories also inspired many to enter careers in science, including astronomers Carl Sagan, Robert Bracewell, Jill Tarter, and space shuttle astronaut Terence Wilcutt, to name but a few. While we continue to explore the Moon, Mars, Venus, 
and other nearby astral bodies orbiting our Sun. We now also look for signals coming from planets orbiting other stars which may indicate intelligent life. Our methods of searching have become more advanced. We now use large automated radio telescopes and laser detectors to search for signals rather than humans looking through telescopes or manually tuning radio dials on vacuum tube receivers. However, our motivations to search remain the same as those described in the New Age article of March 1912. We seek scientific knowledge and, even more, desire to communicate with kindred spirits living on other planets, sharing fellowship, understanding, and wisdom between worlds. John M. Bozeman. This article totally hit home. You know, what initially drew me to the article, or to the issue rather, was when I received it, the cover of the magazine has an image of the New Age magazine on it, which, of course, as mentioned by Dr. Bozeman, was the initial publication that had come out for the Scottish Rite. A wonderful magazine. We've read several of the issues here on the show before. And actually, the article that comes right after this one within the magazine is called Revisiting the New Age. I love the New Age magazine artwork because it's art deco and it's uh, beautiful and some of it just really looks like Alphonse Mucha's work, who is a famous uh, artist of the day dealing with a lot of that Art Nouveau slash Art Deco look, and uh, he also was a brother. But in any case, a fantastic article. If you have not uh, picked this up yet, go to the Scottish Rite website. We'll have a link back to it, and you can download it. You can read it right on your computer, your mobile device, whatever. If you're a member, look for it in your mailbox. If you already got it and it's sitting in a pile of Masonic News stuff, dig it out. Check out the article. Check out the New Age article that comes after it. And once more, a huge thanks to Dr. John M. Bozeman for allowing us to put this awesome article to audio and also to the Scottish Rite who made that possible. Something else from the article that I thought was really cool is the mention of the Flammarion, one of my favorite pieces of art, actually. For our Craftsman Plus, let's talk a little bit about science, communication, Mars, and Freemasonry. Freemasonry is always kind of on the cusp of technology, in the sense that when we first wrote about those liberal arts and sciences, we had a lecture that comprised much of what was known in the world, or at least called people to study those things. And as time went on, those liberal arts and sciences became antiquated. But in order to stay current, sometimes we talk about them. And you know this because we do this on this show too. We talk about a scientific principle and then we tie it back to the show and we tie it back to Freemasonry somehow. And I think that's really important. A few years ago, I mentioned something like a question on Facebook and it was, how would you all feel if I started reading short science pieces that related to the seven liberal arts and sciences and related them back to Freemasonry? And the response was overwhelming that this was positive. And so my question for you is kind of a fun one. It will take some speculation on your part. It does involve space and science. So we all know that a lodge was quote-unquote established on the moon, but until such time that they can actually meet there, they meet in Texas. We're also aware of this idea that Freemasonry may at some point be so small that it goes away forever. What do you think will happen first? Will Freemasonry go away, or will we reach the red planet. And if we reach the red planet, do you think we'll charter a lodge there? Think about that. I think it's an interesting question. It's a fun question. And I'd love to hear what you think. Now, before we go any further in this episode, I want to go ahead and check out what's going on this week in the Masonic Minute with illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison. Let's check it out. I have attended and even spoken at a number of large, auspicious Masonic meetings. A few of them have been so amazing, educational, well-produced, and fraternal that I will never forget them. Among these are the Masonic Roundtable's 300th anniversary celebration at the George Washington National Masonic Memorial a York Rite Symposium in Iowa, where I had the honor of sharing the program with Harry Truman's grandson, Clifton Truman Daniel, the annual Grand Master's Breakfast in St. Louis, and my own Missouri Lodge of Research's Truman Lectures. 
These have all been gargantuan Masonic gatherings, sometimes with hundreds, yes, hundreds of brothers in attendance. A huge crowd is a wonderful part of sharing Masonic fellowship. In these large gatherings, I have had occasion to visit with brothers from not just other jurisdictions, but even other countries, providing opportunities to compare and share the precious diversity within our craft. Large crowds of brothers are uplifting and inspiring, but make no mistake, an audience of dozens or hundreds is not a prerequisite for a great Masonic event. For example, just a few weeks ago I attended another one of those auspicious meetings I will never forget. But only about 23 to 25 brothers were there. I was honored to be the guest speaker at Homer Lodge 199 in Homer, Illinois. Homer is a small rural lodge and by its members own admission attendance is not what it should be. To put it in Senior Warden Darren Lehner's words, we normally are struggling to make a quorum. Darren documented the full extent of this meeting from its conception to planning to execution in a thorough account in a recent Midnight Freemasons article. To read the full story, search for A Night to Remember on the blog. Darren outlines the steps he took to create a successful event that more than tripled the attendance in his lodge. I'd like to share those with you. The funny thing is, said Darren, it really wasn't that hard to do. To start with, I heavily advertised on social media. I started an Eventbrite event page to get a count of how many would be coming in. I'll come back to those two items in just a minute. Darren continued with the steps in what he calls a simple recipe. 1. Get your lodges buy-in. That shouldn't be too hard to do. But what you're really looking for is a space for the event. If not your lodge, there's got to be another one close with suitable space. 2. Arrange a speaker. One of the best places to go is the site MasonicInstruction.com, which not only lists available speakers, but gives their biographies and summarizes their speaking topics. 3. Plan the event. Pretty self-explanatory. This probably will involve a dinner, which can be as elaborate as you want, or maybe just ordering in pizza. 4. Finally, hold the event. According to Darren, if you build it, brethren will come. The process sounds a lot like the old-timey definition of management. Plan, organize, activate, control. I'd like to expand a little on the first two things Darren did. He said he advertised heavily on social media and started an Eventbrite page. I've seen events fail where brothers swear they promoted the event. What did they do? They posted it on Facebook. Brothers, that's not enough. The key word Darren used is that he advertised it heavily. Facebook posts are a dime a dozen or actually a dime a million. So, however you promote the event, become a promotion ninja. The next thing Darren did was to set up an Eventbrite page. If you're not familiar with Eventbrite, learn about it and do it. This will more or less get commitments from people to attend. And I'd like to add a dash of spice to Darren's recipe. Put the cart before the horse. I know of a lodge that practices this and they swear it's a sure thing. First, 
They sell out the event. Then they plan the event. They do as much pre-planning as possible and come up with a couple of dates, then find out if brothers are available on those dates. They then tentatively select a speaker and see when he is available. After a bit of coordination, they find a good time for the event. Then, they sell tickets to the event, moderately priced to cover the cost of a meal. And only when they have sold enough tickets do they actually launch the event. They also limit attendance to 25 brothers, and they sell out every time. Sell out the event, then plan the event. Sounds like a winner if you can pull it off. Not the way we usually do things. With the way he used Eventbrite, that is pretty close to what Darren did. Maybe using that old management definition, you might say putting the cart before the horse is to plan, organize, control, and then activate. It might be something you could try. Follow Darren's advice and plan one of those unforgettable events. But see if it doesn't work better when you put the cart before the horse. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. So what an awesome segment. You know, I was there at that meeting. It was phenomenal. I loved it. A great time. It was awesome to see Steve do his talk. And it was just so cool to see so many brothers from all over the state, really, from as far north as Chicago, from Springfield, Illinois, and all over the place. It was a really great night. And uh, Brother Steve's advice here, I'm really curious about. Let's see if it works. Try it out. You know, if you got to go back and listen to this particular episode again, do it. It kind of harkens back to the uh, episode we had a little while back called The Worshipful Master's Crash Course. Actually, last July, we had this episode, and it was actually one of our most downloaded episodes ever, which tells me something. Maybe we're not doing such a great job at training ourselves to take on these roles. Or maybe we're just really excited about it, and we want to take all the tools with us. Either way, uh, it's out there. It's uh, episode number 504, which came out on July 18th. So our thanks once more to illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison for putting together this great Masonic Minute. You know, videos for all of these Masonic Minutes are available on our YouTube channel, and they get posted there as well. There are slides and images that go along with these, and I think you'll really like them. Check them out. Head on over to WCY Podcast's YouTube channel, linked in our show notes also, and uh, subscribe. Click the like button, turn on notifications, whatever you'd like to do, but those are all there for you. And actually, each time one comes out, we add it to the playlist of Masonic Minutes so that at any time you can just open up that playlist and hit go and watch a slew of these awesome Masonic Minutes. To check out more Brother Stephen L. Harrison's work, Go to WCYpodcast.com, click on the bookstore, and you'll see hot links to all of his books there through Amazon, which are affiliate linked to us. Uh, So if you shop on Amazon through our links, it's a win-win-win. You get a great product, Steve sells a book, and you help out the show. And I'm also going to put a link to the Missouri Lodge of Research in the show notes, where Brother Steve has done so much of his work and continues to work. I wanted to give another thanks to the Fraternal Review, the staff at the Southern California Research Lodge for all the excellent work they're doing and for putting all of these excellent authors together in this awesome book set that they did. Uh, If you missed that episode and you're like, hey, what book set? Well, it's too late. The books are totally sold out. All those awesome top 10 library sets are gone. So many thanks to the folks out there who bought those up and helped bring even more great content to the future from the Southern California Research Lodge's Fraternal Review. My thanks goes out one more time to Brother Dago and Brother Ian for what can only be described as an unprecedented smash out of the park home run with that issue. And thanks for coming on the show to talk about it. 
Earlier in the episode, I mentioned that Grand Lodge Sessions this year is going to be happening, of course, uh, in person, and I wanted to tell you just a very quick bit about something happening on Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. in Plaza Room Number 3. This is the Illinois Lodge of Research's annual meeting. I'd love for you to come out because we're going to have a great keynote speaker, Brother Darren Laners, here of the Midnight Freemasons and uh, you know, the Meet Act Part podcast. He's going to be doing a really cool presentation on Harry Potter and Freemasonry. Maybe you've seen the videos that we released regarding this kind of little sizzle reel of his lecture, but I think it's going to be really fun and educational and introspective. And in the event that the Grand Lodge happens to go virtual or closes out because of COVID, just rest assured that the Illinois Lodge of Research will be doing a VR presentation of this if that happens. So just like a Zoom webinar type thing that we'll put together for the occasion. And one more thing before we get into the second piece of education is news about more education. I want to mention that the second issue of the Lyceum will be out shortly. What is that? It's an Illinois Masonic Education magazine under the purview of the Grand Lodge of Illinois. I am lucky enough to serve as kind of the editor-in-chief under our chairman, Brother Michael Overturf, and uh, we've been putting together this thing now, and it's got a, a lot of great reviews, and we're really excited about this next issue that's coming out, and it's currently under review by the Grand Line and the Grand Master, so hopefully we'll get the uh, stamp of approval on that as soon as possible. And we'll get it out there for everybody who's interested to be able to download it. And thanks to everybody out there who downloaded that first issue and gave us some great feedback. Now, as I was just mentioning earlier about this idea of some science and how Freemasonry attaches itself to some of these interesting ideas, one place that has been continually doing this idea of blending and talking about what seems to be abstract concepts and tying them back to Freemasonry or practical masonry is the Masonic Philosophical Society. I would recommend checking out their philosophicalsociety.org. It is a great website. And on June 29th of 2019, a great article entitled Fear and Freemasonry was published and written by Kristen Wilson Slack. Now, she is a friend of the show, a friend of mine. And uh, many of us who are all over Internet Freemasonry know Kristen and her great works as well. And she wrote this piece, and I wanted to read it for you now. She's actually in the Craftsman Plus group, uh, for those of you out there who don't know. And she's awesome. So anyway, Kristen, if you're listening, you're amazing. Thanks for letting us read your work. And her contributions are also in the How to Charter a Lodge book that we released. So check that out if you're interested, available on wcypodcast.com. So here we go, Fear and Freemasonry by Kristen Wilson Slack. It opens with a quote by one of my favorites, Frank Herbert, author of Dune, soon to be a another big motion picture that everybody's excited about. So here's that quote. I must not fear, fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear, I will permit it to pass over me and through me, and when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing, only I will remain. In your youth, we rail against the unfairness of the world. In developing our philosophies, we also develop our fears. In a recent discussion group regarding specific symbolism of Freemasonry, the question was asked, how do I get rid of fears which are really false gods? Fear, one person postulated, is that which motivates negative behavior. Another postulated that fear motivates all behavior. After much discussion, we never really came to a solid conclusion about how to mitigate fear. Fear is the unpleasant sensation caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, threatening, or likely to cause pain. That definition is ripe with opportunity for dissection, to pull apart the chunks that create philosophical reasons for fear. First of all, it is an unpleasant sensation, and humans hate unpleasant feelings. No one really wants to feel icky, and yet that icky feeling is built on a belief. It is not necessarily based on fact or reason. 
It is simply a belief. By definition, a belief is a trust, faith, or confidence in something. Taken apart and put back together, we can say that fear is an icky feeling caused by a trust, faith, or confidence that something or someone is out to cause some kind of harm to our person, our connections, or perhaps our way of life. This explanation is not to trivialize fear or some major manifestations of fear like post-traumatic stress syndrome. This is simply to discuss common fears that most, if not all of us, experience. Are fears founded? Some yes, some perhaps not. In the face of an immediate disaster, fear is certainly appropriate. Sigmund Freud said about real fear versus neurotic fear, quote, You will understand me without more ado when I term this fear real fear in contrast to neurotic fear. Real fear seems quite rational and comprehensible to us. We may testify that it is a reaction to the perception of external danger vis-a-vis -vis harm that is expected and foreseen. It is related to the flight reflex and may be regarded as an expression of the instinct of self-preservation. And so the occasion, that is to say, the objects and situations that arouse fear will depend largely on our knowledge of and our feeling of power over the outer world. Proceeding now to neurotic fear, what are its manifestations and conditions? In the first place, we find a general condition of anxiety, a condition of free floating fear as it were which is ready to attach itself to any appropriate idea, to influence judgment, to give rise to expectations. In fact, to seize any opportunity to make itself felt. We call this condition expectant fear or anxious expectation. Persons who suffer from this sort of fear always prophesy the most terrible of all possibilities, interpret every coincidence as an evil omen, and ascribe a dreadful meaning to all uncertainty. Many persons who cannot be termed ill show this tendency to anticipate disaster." End quote. That is, fear is simply the lack of feeling powerful over our own world, whether it is caused by an oncoming tornado or by feelings of inadequacy. What we are concerning ourselves with here is what Freud called neurotic fears. Yet, the basis for our reactions, that lack of control, does come from the same fight or flight process of survival. Both have their roots in control. It was once explained to me that all vices, sloth, envy, greed, avarice, gluttony, pride, and lust are all major manifestations of fear. Aristotle, in Nicomachean Ethics, made similar statements explaining that virtues and vices were a spectrum and deficiencies were the expressions of the ends of the spectrum. Management courses in many places talk about how to address employees' fears with some of these same techniques, but again, no one really gets to the heart of dealing with fear head on. So, we know what fear might be and how it manifests, but how do we actually deal with it? In younger days, I read a series of books based on the Michael teachings. These teachings are channeled thoughts on life and living, how and why people do what they do, and general human relations. One aspect that stayed with me had to do with fears. Many people have a dominant negative attitude which they must overcome in their lives. Some examples of these are self-deprecation, self-destruction, martyrdom, stubbornness, greed, impatience, arrogance. Many of us go through all of these at some time in our lives, but in general we stick with one, maybe two, when we're tired, depressed, feeling overwhelmed, or just not working at our peak. When our sense of comfort, our inner child is attacked or feeling vulnerable, we resort to these attitudes, which are really manifestations of fear. These are born from our childhood and are placed there by our reactions to environment and experiences. Each of these books is based in a very specific fear and can be overcome with conscious effort. These are the dominant negative attitudes with their spectrum of manifestation, to use Aristotle's idea of a sliding scale of virtue and vices. 1. Self-deprecation is the fear of not being good enough. 
It manifests as humility, a positive attribute to self-abasement or negativeness. Greed is the fear of not having enough, manifests as egoism, desire, a positive to veracity, gluttony, the negative. Self-destruction is the fear of losing control, manifests as self-sacrifice, a positive to suicide, immolation, the negative. Martyrdom is the fear of not being worthy. It manifests as selflessness, as the positive, to victim mentality, as the negative. Stubbornness, a fear of change or new situations. It manifests as willfulness or determination as a positive, to obstinacy or the negative. Impatience is the fear of missing or losing opportunities. It manifests as audacity, positive, to intolerance, negative, and arrogance is the fear of being vulnerable. It manifests as pride, the positive, to vanity as the negative. In taking a deeper look into our own behavior, it may be easier to see how a reaction to one situation or another traces backward to one of these negative attitudes and the fear which grounds it. When one swings from pride in a job well done to believing that the job done was the best job anyone has ever seen, there might be some fear going on there. That line that separates the two extremes can be different for different people, and it is clear that we all have different levels of tolerance and abilities to process reactions when we encounter fear. When we start delving beyond the surface of our own psyche, introspection uncovers perhaps those negative attitudes based in experiences of childhood. An excerpt from the Michael teachings. Quote, Children create, depending on environmental experience and personal proclivities, distorted worldviews. We all create these distortions, big and small, and they eventually become our personal myths. Think, I'm ugly, I'm stupid, or I'm not going to eat tonight. Repeated situations or traumatic events reinforce this myth. Driven by a deeply held fear and steered by a distorted worldview, the emerging dominant negative attitude springs into action in their lives, even unto adulthood. The child thinks, for instance, I will stop life from hurting by taking control of my pain. I will hurt myself more than anybody else can. The child's chosen survival strategy involves some sort of conflict, a war against itself, against others, or against life. It is a defensive behavior pattern which looks irrational from the outside, but from the child's perspective is perfectly rational. As we mature, we must address these dominant negative attitudes or they will endanger any chance of self-improvement. They hide our true nature." End quote. When someone lashes out at me or others, I believe the reason is always fear. Fear is not the motivator of all activity we do. It always seems, though, that fear is the core of truly negative and destructive behaviors. Hatred, lies, and fanaticism are true fear-based reactions and attitudes. In dealing with these reactions in the world, we need to keep in mind that fear is the motivator and that perhaps by making the person feel safe, by letting them air their real fears, healing can begin. At another study group, we discussed fear and how to use it to unravel truth. It struck me then that Freemasonry provided us opportunities to run up against our own and others' fears. From speaking in front of a group to taking charge of ritual work to providing leadership for volunteer work, Freemasonry offers us a chance to continually transmute fears into relationship gold by providing the types of experiences that test us and force us to face those fears. Why does the Freemason care about fears? There is a lot of the world that runs on a steady diet of fear. The only way to find a better world and improve humanity is to rise above those things which cause us to live a base, irrational, and mundane life. By addressing and recognizing when people are moving in fear, we can possibly stop the cycle for them and for ourselves. Additionally, Freemasons strive to be leaders. Leadership is about learning what motivates people. By learning their fears and helping them maneuver around them, we find talents and skills waiting to be uncovered. Leadership is shedding light on that which holds people back from being the very best they can be. Addressing fears is difficult unless we create true, honest dialogue. Freemasonry provides an environment to express honesty and be supported. This honest dialogue extends to ourselves. What are our fears? What is our dominant negative attitude? And how does it affect me 
my family, and my connections? What relationships are healthy and positive and which are not? Asking why is a good start. Perhaps looking at the motivations within us which cause us to have painful relationships with others, we can come face to face with our fear. In order to do that, we need to be able to actively look at our behavior, assess any damage we cause ourselves, and like Paul Atreides from the Dune series, turn an inner eye to the path it has taken and find ourselves in its wake. Quote, Try looking into that place where you dare not look. You'll find me there, staring out at you. End quote. Paul Muad'Dib to the Reverend Mother from Frank Herbert's Dune. Well, there you have this fascinating look at how fear manifests in our lives and how Freemasonry offers us tools to overcome. My question for all of you is, we're thinking about self-reflections here, to look deep inside of ourselves, to ask that question, why? A friend of mine, Faya, recently told me I had to figure out my why in relation to my own anxieties. And I had to do some real reflection there. I'm still working on it. It's a massive thing to do. But what is your why? What is the honest dialogue we can have with ourselves about what our fears are? My question for the Craftsman Plus is not to ask yourself this why question. That is for you to ponder yourself because it's nothing that you can really write down and put in the chat group for everybody to see. And and maybe you can at some point, but it's a big question. Instead, I'd like to ask you, what fears has Freemasonry assisted you in overcoming? For some of us, this might be public speaking. For others, it might be to find a place to open up about past vice that you've had in your life, or who knows what it could be. I know what mine is, and I will definitely be sharing that in the group with all of you. And um, I hope that we find some strength in each other's answers and know that we're all there and we have gone through similar things together. And so that will be in the Craftsman Plus as a question for you guys this week. That's it for this week. I do want to thank you all one more time for coming with us on this episode of the Whence Came You podcast. I want to thank the journal from the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction for letting me read out of the magazine. I want to thank Dr. John Bozeman for his work. I want to thank uh, Kristen Slack for her excellent write-ups that she does. I want to thank all of our contributors, fellows, producers, and legacy partners. I want to thank Brother Steve Harrison for his continued work. Thank you guys all so much for bringing this show to the masses who are interested in Freemasonry and its quote-unquote kindred sciences, as Albert Mackey might have said. Until next week, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition. 